Okay, so before I share my screen, let me briefly introduce myself. So, my name is Stefan, and uh, as Christian already told you, I'm from the same organization as Kasper, who talked to you last week. Um, yeah, we are um, a small NGO located in Germany, close to Berlin, and we focus very much on the implementation of so-called tiny forests. And what actually a tiny forest is, um, I will explain in this lecture. And in the following weeks, we will have two more lectures. So the second lecture will be about um, more specifically how to implement the tiny forest in your region, in Gozo. And the third lecture will go very much into the details. And we hope that we, until this point, will already have um, identified an area where we can plant. So yeah, we can. Um, I can give the lecture specifically on that side. Um, yeah, let's jump right into it. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so you should should now see it. Let's start. So, as I already mentioned, uh, the topic on today's lecture is tiny forest introduction, learning from people who have done it before. Let's start. So, uh, I studied seven years forestry, and um, during my studies, I focused a lot on the relationship between nature and humans. And... In the end, uh, doing my research, I thought, all right, what should we do in order to really and holistically get our global problems fixed? Because I figured out that uh, the environmental crisis wasn't really only an environmental crisis, but more a socio-environmental or ecological crisis. So um, as we see on these two pictures, should illustrate a certain problem, which is that nature has either in the spaces where we live, in the cities where most people live, nor in the brains of many humans, really um, a big value or space. So we are facing certain problems, which we could sum up as this um, under the name socio-ecological crisis or challenges, which are, for example, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, um, social inequalities, mental health issues, physical health problems, alienation from nature, which is like the topic where I focused on my master thesis. And um, I thought, all right, is it really enough to implement um, environmental solutions to fix our problems and uh, yeah, to go forward to a green, healthy future for human beings and uh, all other beings on this planet? Or do, or do we more need um, yeah, a kind of more social aspect within these ecological solutions? Um, yeah, and just to recap the last lecture from Kaspar, I think the ones who were in it remember this uh, this graph. So that from the past to this uh, to our current situation, we really much changed the ecosystems. We changed the yeah, we changed our land, and. Um, when it was like uh, before the human influence, the massive human influence, we had big healthy forests and big healthy grasslands, and now we have uh, cities and um, a lot of a lot of areas used for agriculture and uh, other human uses. So we really need to implement ecological solutions yeah. to. Uh, to help the whole biosphere, to help the globe to stay functional and to regulate certain parameters, for example, the temperature on our Earth, to yeah, to stay within the limits where life can exist. Um, but we have to do it together. So uh, we need many people to do that and uh, to regenerate the land where they live as a community. 
So during my studies, me and a colleague of mine, we came across this guy, Akira Miyawaki, and we were fascinated by his by his work and his ideas. Briefly to his person, um, Akira Miyawaki was a Japanese botanist and environmental scientist. He became the director of the Japanese Center for International Studies in Ecology. And he is the founder of the so-called Miyawaki method, which later then uh, became the basis for this tiny forest concept. Fun fact, Akira Miyawaki uh, stayed, I think, three or four years of his career when he was uh, studying in Germany, since Germany was uh, for a long time the yeah, maybe the leading country in ecology and especially in forestry. And he learned about the concept of the potential, natural potential vegetation, uh, which Kasper explained to you last week. Um, yeah, and in Japan, he faced uh, very specific uh, problems, which were that in his country, he where um, cities at the coast were very exposed to extreme weather events like uh, hurricanes and tsunamis and stuff. So very, very regularly, the cities and villages at the coast were flooded and destroyed a lot of infrastructure. And what he noticed was that uh, in areas where there were still existing catches of vegetation, that the houses and infrastructure behind this ecological islands were still intact while other parts of the cities were destroyed. And then he found that the more natural and the more diverse these ecosystems were, the more, the more they were stable and protective. And then he started to search. He started to do the research where to find healthy and stable ecosystems in Japan in order to bring more of these ecosystems back to the coast and also other regions. Um, and this was a very difficult task. And the only remaining islands of healthy, stable, native and diverse uh, woodlands or forests he could find around temples because these temples were always uh, yeah were always understood to be holy places sacred places where the holiness of nature was still preserved by the monks and which is a very very interesting fact actually and it's a phenomenon which we find in many other places for example also in Ethiopia i just recently came across this very interesting example where also in the middle is a church and it really located in the desert. And there, there are many of these patches in the desert of Ethiopia where, uh, yeah, where humans were able to take care of nature and where the nature itself, when it, yeah, because it didn't get destroyed, but uh, it was remained, it's still functional, even though the surrounding area is very dry and, uh, seems to be not very suitable for forest, but still the forest itself is functional enough and holds enough water to, uh, yeah, to be a healthy system. Um, so Akira Miyawaki, he did his research. He went to these places, he collected seeds. Uh, he, he took a look at the forest soil and um, tried to really understand the whole ecosystem. And then he thought, okay, so how can I uh, increase the process of this, like the natural process of an area, like a degraded area becoming a forest again? And I think, I don't know if we saw this graphic last time, but uh, we talked, or you, Kasper, talked with you about the natural succession. Maybe also to recap this briefly, the natural succession describes the process from a degraded land with no, no topsoil, no microbes in the soil, no vegetation at all, um, through various stages of ecosystem development to a final stage, which is in many, many areas a forest. 
And this final stage of an ecosystem we call climax forest or climax ecosystem. And during this process, like when we start here at number one with the degraded ecosystem, slowly in the beginning come small plants like lichens and moss and small grasses. Later, the shrubs come in, then the pioneer species. And finally, in the temperate climate, where like in Germany, for example, where we live, it takes what, 200 to 300 years until a climax forest has developed. Um, yeah, after this period of time, we have this functional ecosystem, which uh, doesn't change very much in uh, the distribution of plant species. Um, it's very functional. It holds a lot of water. And on the graph down here, we see like the increase over time in biodiversity, biomass, and the top soil layer. So during all the stages, uh, all these parameters go up. And in the end, we have a very nutrient-rich soil. We have an ecosystem which is full of life, full of different species, which has a lot of structure and which holds a lot of biomass. And Akira Miyawaki, this is, these are two graphs from scientific publications, but uh, don't be too scared. This is the, the most scientific part of this whole uh, lecture. Um, so what we see here at the left, and what we see here at the right is uh, the similar content. So in the top, we have the ecosystem which have been degraded and um, after human impact, and we have the bare land. So the left path here is the natural succession we just have seen at the uh, graph before. And on the right, we see Miyawaki's approach, Miyawaki's um, succession theory or succession method, which basically uh, consists of three different aspects, which are the initial enrichment of the topsoil, like 20 centimeters of humus rich and biologically active topsoil, um, planting young seedlings of the main tree species of the potential natural vegetation um, and mix them very dense and randomly like nature does. And with his method, he could show that the process of um, a degraded land to become a climax forest would take instead of 200 plus years, only 25 to 30 years. So it's only 10% of the time to achieve the result nature would achieve itself. So basically the Miyawaki method is a method to help nature, like to increase the process, the speed of the process for nature to develop a climax ecosystem. And the Miyawaki method can be broken down to some major steps, which is step one, the soil survey. So we must know on which specific location we are, what the soil conditions are. We were talking, uh, Kasper was talking about the soil, if it's a sandy soil or a clay soil or something in between. Um, we must know the water situation and some other parameters, the sun and shadow uh, constellation. Then based on the survey, we select our species and uh, we select them by researching the potential natural vegetation and also by researching like um, uh, taking a look on the future developments like prognosis, how maybe uh, climate like uh, rain, temperature and so on are going to develop. And if we, in addition to this potential natural vegetation, should look for some other tree species, maybe also asking local experts which species are performing well uh, currently. And when we came up with a very diverse and mostly native uh, list of tree species. We start the soil engineering where we try to um, where we try to improve the soil, especially the topsoil. And um, what we want to do 
is to improve some soil parameters, which is the uh, water infiltration and the water holding capacity. The, the soil should be loose so that the roots can easily penetrate into the soil. The soil should be rich in humus so that it supports nutrient availability and, um, and microbiology like fungus and bacteria. And once we engineered our soil that way, then the plants we selected are going to be planted dense and randomly. Uh, I'm going to show a slide how this exactly looks like in a second. And then after two or three years of caretaking, which is mostly watering during the dry and hot season, we reach a self-sufficient little forest, which is going to grow, to develop. And after 25 years, we have this climax forest we were talking about, this very functional, stable little ecosystem. The plant list we divide in different layers so that we have uh, not only diversity in three species, but also in different, uh, in different layers so that there's a lot of structure. We try to um, give many different species space in our little ecosystem because every species might have other abilities. Some might root very deeply and take water up. Some might fix, for example, nitrogen through bacteria in the soil from the atmosphere. Some might produce biomass rapidly, shade out the area in order to support more shade loving uh, climax tree species. Uh, some might attract insects or birds pollinators or birds bringing other seeds into the system. So we really want to make sure that uh, we create um, a system which is diverse in structure and in species. Here we see an example of, on the left side, a little tiny forest we planted in a city. This one is really planted only some months ago. And as you can see, it's spring. The green leaves are just starting to come out and uh, starting to uh, grow for the first sunlight of the year. And what this picture illustrates is a dense planting. In a tiny forest, we usually plant three to five plants, little seedlings per square meter. Um, and because many people ask us, hey, but why do you plant so dense? Won't most of these trees die in some years? And the answer is we plant so dense because nature does it like that. So on the right side, I took a photo of a natural beach forest, which is uh, in the region where I live or where our association is located, the natural potential vegetation. Vegetation It's very much dominated by beech trees and um, in the edge zones of the forest. And depending on the specific location, there are some other trees uh, mixed into the system. Um, and here we see, or I just counted, that per square meter we find 30 to 40 seedlings. And these ones have already an age of some years, of five or six years. So nature regenerates itself very densely, like very quantitative. So the big tree is going to drop many, many seeds on the ground each year, each year. And as soon as a mother tree falls down due to, uh, because it just became too old, uh, yeah, there's a fungus, there's a wind event, something like that, a storm, the big tree falls and light penetrates through the canopy and reaches the ground. And this triggers or stimulates the regeneration process. So all the seeds which are in the ground start the race for light. So they are in competition. And through this competition, they grow very rapidly. And in the end, the most adapted, the most strong genetic variation and the strongest species are going to make the race. And uh, so this is like the, the how, how to say, like the, the in, in nature, in these for, forest ecosystems, imprinted guarantee to 
regenerate itself in a way that is stable and resistant because the more stable and resistant individuals are going to survive in the end. And this is basically what we want to mimic with a tiny forest, that we give many species, like big quantity and species, but also big quantity um, within one species into the area. And uh, so the chances are very high that the species and also the variations within one species, which are uh, best prepared or best adapted to the current situation, will win the race and form later this ecosystem, which is hopefully going to be as stable as possible. Yeah, for the plant selection, this is just a picture which is illustrating it. This is one planting list from, from us, which just illustrate how diverse, how diverse we plant. And in the next lectures, we are going to take a closer look also to uh, the natural vegetation in Gozo. And maybe we are going to look at, um, at other suitable plants which might work. This is just an example. Like, yeah, on the left, we have some shrubs. Here at the right bottom corner, uh, right top corner, bigger trees, and here also shrubs and even uh, little grasses or flowers, which could be part of the system. Yeah, maybe you remember what we, Kasper, told you last time about the soil. So generally, a forest soil contains of uh, yeah, like a mulch layer or a layer where dead biomass like branches and leaves which are dropped by bigger trees or bigger plants um, st slowly start to decompose when they decompose we call the end product humus humus is the very dark like compost smelling uh, layer of soil which contains a lot of nutrition and uh, a lot of life then there is the topsoil which is a mixture of the soil of the location, like the mineral soil, like the sand or the clay or whatever it is, uh, which is mixed with the humus. And the mixing takes place through the organisms, the local organisms like earthworms, for example, or, uh, or bacteria or nematodes or whatever there is in the soil. And then in the end, we have the subsoil so really the mineral soil and in the end really the like the stone the compact um, the compact layer or the final ground and this is basically how every every soil somehow looks like and what we want to do when we improve the soil we want to mimic the natural soil because usually when we look at a de like degraded land, we will only find this uh, B horizon. There is usually no topsoil, no humus layer, and no mulch layer at all. So uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, we want to improve all the layers and mimic this layering uh, so that we reach. A situation which is very much similar to a local to, to how the soil would look like in your local healthy forest ecosystem and how we do it there are many different substrates and i think in germany we are a little bit more privileged than maybe in gozo um, because there's like a a whole industry for also very specific products already. So what we and our products are uh, in our projects are using to improve soil quality uh, is something we use it most of the time, which is called terra preta, which is um, a combination of compost, so just decomposed organic waste. I think compost you can buy in most countries with. Uh, with biochar and biochar is local biomass which has been uh, like kind of burned without oxygen so that we that we get uh, little char charcoal structures 
which have a lot of very great properties, like for example, they uh, they hold a lot of water, they can hold a lot of nutrition through their little, like this microstructure, they can host a lot of microorganisms. So it's a very, very interesting product. And at least for our German product uh, projects where we have already companies who produce it on a large scale, we uh, use it to improve the soil quality very rapidly. Um, and who's interested in this topic, I think I have also some video recommendations uh, somewhere or I send it afterwards. Um, but anyway, besides this Terra Preta, we can improve the soil with, uh, with pure compost. Um, and also we can inoculate the soil with microorganisms and also with fungus. And um, especially in old forest systems, fungals play a major role. Like in the early succession stages, the soil is very bacteria dominant. And the older the forest becomes, the forest becomes more fungus dominant, the forest soil. And there are also here in Germany, there are different products, how you can inoculate your system, your soil with a specific bacteria and fungus. But there are also other ways like... Uh, low-tech uh, ways, which I'm going to show in a second. So, yeah, what else we can do when we don't have these professional inoculants and uh, terapreta, for example? We can take, for example, manure. Like manure, I hope this is um, uh, something you understand. Otherwise, it's, yeah, it's a shit of cow or horse. Uh, which is also very rich in nutrition. And uh, after it had laid for a year or so, um, because then it's too, um, there's too much uh, free nitrogen, which is not beneficial for, for the planting because it can burn the roots of, uh, of the seedlings we planted. After it has laid some month until a year, it becomes a really good humus which is easily accessible in most regions to improve the soil with. Um, I looked up from other projects, for example, in India, they are using rice shells, for example, or other local biomass, which then slowly decomposes and also improves the structure of the soil. So when it decomposes, you're going to, to mix it with the soil. And when it decomposes, it gives its nitro, uh, its uh, nutrition to the soil, can also hold water and uh, helps against compaction of the soil. Then was also nice, especially at the mulch layer, when there are leaves. I know in, in Germany, in the cities or in the gardens, people uh, in the autumn, they try to get rid of all the leaves, so nobody, nobody wants to see the leaves laying around, and uh, it's kind of a rubbish. Um, but it's a very, very valuable uh, mulch product because it has grown natural. It's like a waste product, but there are a lot of nutrition inside, and as they decompose local microorganisms and uh, local fungus are going to be attracted by this leaves and uh, so it's a very very beneficial product for uh, for our tiny forest projects um, something else is like just shredded wood which is a byproduct of the uh, wood industry so when they when they cut the logs like when when trees uh, end up in the industry and they make construction wood out of it this shredded wood is usually a byproduct which you can which you can buy to improve your soil and to use as a mulch layer, and there's something very interesting, uh, which is the technology of making your own compost tea. This is very low tech. Um, all you need is some compost, water, and then a then a pump, which uh, which brings night uh, oxygen into the water, so that aerobic oxygen loving microorganisms in the compost uh, that they multiply in the water. You mix some sugar into the water. Um, a good instruction to that I also added uh, 
somewhere so you will receive it for sure um so these are some more low-tech resources which you can use to improve your soil and once you're done your site could be look something like this from the top so what this picture should illustrate is like the surrounding here this brown brownish area um this is the mineral soil just the open soil i think in this in this case it was a, a kind of a clay very compacted and the dark area you see is the area where we added a lot of humus and um, we opened up the soil to loosen it so that it's uh, it's very easy to plant trees in it and here these uh, these little round patches this is this is shredded wood which after the planting is going to be used as a as the mulch layer so this could your site could look like this uh, once you prepared everything for plant regarding this uh, the soil preparation we did a little research project on ourselves because uh, some people were very skeptical if this quite of time and energy and also cost intense initial soil preparation is really worth it because in forestry usually no one would do it i mean to be to be fair in forestry the areas that are going to be planted are so big that on an area of hectares and hectares uh, of land to be reforested this is no proper method but for our tiny forests which are usually at the size size of i don't know 200 until 2000 square meters it's still very suitable and what we can see here i'm sorry that, uh, that the text is in german but i'm going to translate it so on the left side of this research field we did no soil preparation at all this was also on a clay soil in very close to us here and close to Berlin. And on the right side, we did soil preparation, which was that we came with a with an excavator and the excavator opened up the soil. It loosened the soil until a depth of one meter. And then local biomass, in this case, compost and straw were mixed into the ground. And then we planted the trees. And last year we did a laser scan with together with the University for Sustainable Development and the group IT for Forests with some, yeah, some laser uh, future technology. And we detected the differences in biomass growth. And what we could see is that the survival rates of the planted trees and also the biomass uh, growth within the first Two years, I think, is this picture were significantly higher. So um, we could show that at least in this case, the soil preparation made a very big difference. And uh, we know now from other research sites in Ireland and in England, which has shown different results. So this is only like a little scientific backup on the uh, yeah, on how reasonable this soil preparation actually is. Yeah, this is only a photo from the top. Here it says like after one and a half years. And again, on the left side, we can see, this time on the left side, we can see the soil preparation area. And on the right side, the area with no preparation. The trees we were planting were exactly the same, like same species, same amount and uh, same distribution. The only difference was really the soil preparation. So now we like very briefly starting to understand what a tiny forest is. So a tiny forest is a natural ecosystem or the kickstart of a little natural ecosystem, which is makes mostly sense to be implemented on very degraded land in cities, but also rural areas. And the whole methodology consists 
basically on a proper soil preparation, native plants in high numbers and uh, high structure with many different tree species, a mulching layer, and um, a group of people who plants it, plants it, and takes care of it. And the, the obvious effects of these tiny forests are for us humans, recreation, then of course the cooling. So uh, I just saw a report from England from the organization Earthwatch today, um, where they researched uh, many different tiny forests last year and they could show in the th summer month uh, cooling of the tiny forest of six, six degrees Celsius uh, different within the tiny forest and without uh, yeah, in the tiny forest and outside of the tiny forest. So yeah, cooling. Then of course biodiversity. So different trees and shrubs and the healthy soil supports a lot of different uh, wildlife, which can, especially in the first stages of these tiny forests, uh, birds and insects and later little mammals. Um, clean air is another point. So as we all know, there is that trees can, uh, yeah, they work kind of like filters for the air. Um, healthy soil, soils, we talked about this a lot. Carbon, uh, carbon storage. So in the biomass, we store carbon for sure. So as the trees grow, they sequester uh, carbon from the atmosphere and uh, so all, every tiny forest even though the the amounts are not that high store a certain amount of carbon so there's also a master thesis from some student from the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands and there they could show that the regular uh, yeah like the tiny forest of the size of 250 square meters stores um stores around 12 tons of carbon equivalent in his final stage so this is quite a lot it's not it's not the world but it's really a lot so if we plant a lot of tiny forests we can also store a lot of carbon and the last point water storage and also infiltration uh so i mean in general it gets drier and drier due to climate change but we also are facing extreme weather events. So at least here in Germany, the summers get drier and hotter, but then we eventually have um, have very heavy rains and especially in cities, we are not prepared for this. So the cities get flooded and uh, the heavy rains, they cause a lot of damage. Uh, so, so creating areas which can infiltrate water into the soil uh, really helps our cities to be prepared for this kind of extreme weather events. And water storage is also important, like that with the roots, the trees uh, pump up water, which they can transpirate. And so they are cooling their surroundings through that. This is what is kind of obviously what a tiny forest uh, or a forest in general do. But uh, taking a look under the surface, um, and I will illustrate this, these points, these social points uh, uh, in a second. Tiny forests provide the potential for the individual and for the community to grow as well. Because the idea is always with a tiny forest, as you are also going to do as a group, that we come together as a local community, it can be a school, it can be just a group of local active people. Uh, we recently also planted with, uh, let's say, with uh, old people in a care center, um, that there's a group which, which uh, organizes and plans this whole project, then they're going to plant all the trees together. And then these people, the local group is also taking care of this tiny forest. And this helps in people to, um, for the individual to have feelings of self-effectiveness, 
of nature connection and a sense of responsibility and also a sense of community, obviously, because you can only achieve this goal of creating such a tiny forest with a group together. So these are competences and skills and also feelings, which especially in these times, which are very challenging, uh, especially psychologically, because we see so much bad news and people often lose their hope that, um, yeah, we really need some positive actions and some positive feelings in ourselves and in our community. So a tiny forest can be a very great tool if we successfully implement it all together to uh, really looking forwards way more positively to the future because we have we then have the feeling, all right, I did this one tiny forest, maybe I can do another one or maybe I can regenerate even uh, larger landscapes. So uh, it gives you skills and then with these skills, comes uh, a lot of more feelings of uh, of hope and ideas how you can create a more positive future. Um, so the current distribution, this is also very interesting um, in like, like the two main organizations on implementing these tiny forests in Europe, uh, they are in England or in uh, Great Britain in general, it's called Earthward Europe. They have way more than 100, I think 150 or 200 projects already implemented. And the same counts for IVN Nature Educate. This is a Dutch organization yeah, in the Netherlands. And uh, they have implemented also a lot of tiny forests. And there are organizations in France and Belgium. We are here in Germany, the leading organization. Um, and also worldwide, I don't know if I don't have this slide right here, but uh, worldwide there are already thousands of these projects on all continents in South America, in India, in Pakistan, in African countries. So the method really spreads worldwide and I mean it must be adapted because the conditions in each climate zone and each country and the availability of plants and um, biomass and so on and so forth, very different. But still, um, there's really a network. And this is an experience we also made as an association. It really is very supporting and open source network of people who are helping each other to share their experiences and to implement this project everywhere. So it's really um, encouraging and uh, Great to see how in every country, everywhere in the world, pop up organizations and local groups to regenerate small areas with this method. And there have been also approaches to regenerate bigger areas with a method. Method I will, I think I will show a picture later. So just for you to have a little context, what's currently going on and how many people and groups are already um, part of it and. Yeah, so it's still a pioneer movement and it's going to be great to implement also a tiny forest in Gozo and then you are going to be the pioneers there. Mm. Maybe very briefly, you will get this presentation later anyway, so uh, you, can, you can read it up or uh, take your time. But the general requirements for an area, I will just pick some out, is... Uh, a minimum size of 100 square meters, uh, it, but it's great when it's way bigger, like 500, for example, 1,000 square meters, something like that. And you need uh, around 200 square meters extra for delivery of materials and uh, yeah, like like the logistics, the infrastructure for logistics. Um, if you want no rooftop infrastructure, this is especially important for, for cities that you don't interfere with uh, any buildings. So uh, there's often a lot of, a lot of uh, rights of other people you, know, you should take care of. Um, there should be no underground infrastructure, which is very important that there is no like water or electricity or some other infrastructure in the ground because you're going to dig um and so there should be nothing you can destroy otherwise you, you have a problem um the area should be 
accessible for the public. So it's always great to have these spaces as open spaces. You need a water supply. So this is very important because the areas need watering within the first two to three years, then they become self-sufficient. But within the first years, it's important to water them so that you uh, you have the trees to establish at the site. Um, yeah, basically that design with path and green classroom is possible. This is uh, always nice. So it's not a absolute requirement, but if you can integrate paths and uh, a place like a green classroom where a group of people or just citizens can learn, do citizen science, or just uh, go there for recreation. This is very, uh, very much wanted. Here you see some examples, two examples of tiny forests in Europe. These ones are in the Netherlands. Um, I will show later examples which are more realistically to the situation in Gozo, but just to illustrate what the basic idea is. So we see it's a, it's a neighborhood, it's an urban space. Before there was only a green area, like grass, which in the summer becomes uh, very dry and yellow and the area is basically dead. Um, and these tiny forests, they uh, both of them are more or less 300 square meters uh, of size. So now you have maybe uh, get a feeling of uh, what 300 square meters looks like more or less. And then you see here on the left side and also on the right side is a uh, possibility to really uh, for the public or the local group to really become part of this little forest. So to really uh, get into it and have this forest atmosphere for recreation or for little science programs. Um, yeah, and some words to our organization. Uh, and then I show some examples of what we implemented because, yeah, I want to give you some reason why you should listen to me. Um, and yeah, since the last three years, so we already only exist since 2021, but our organization has started uh, with a lot of energy. And um, in Germany, we were the first one with some other little organizations to pick up this topic and uh, yeah, it became very astonishing how how positive the resonance in politics and society in general was. So we were able within the first three years to implement 21 tiny forests in across whole Germany. Uh, we planted 20,000 trees and I think around little more than 1,000 people, mostly school children, were engaged in the projects and are now taking care of these areas. Uh, yeah, we got fundings, we got awards, we are cooperating with universities, especially with the University for Sustainable Development in Eberswalde, close to Berlin. And uh, we got a team with a lot of expertise in forestry, international forestry, global change management, and so on. So, yeah, actually, I, we created our dream uh, job, dream profession. And uh, also, yeah, talking about this, I want to encourage everyone that it's really possible when you have a good idea, uh, especially like ecological solution these days. Um, yeah, really go for it. You can make a living from that. And also, you can have a lot of fun and a lot of meaning within the actions you do. Um, so the vision, and we are now for the last part, are slowly coming uh, to the social part. Like the vision of or our interpretation of the tiny forest method uh, is really based on three aspects with uh, which has for us the same value. So obviously, we try to implement ecological solutions to increase biodiversity, preserve nature, tackle climate change, or help help to adapt to climate change, climatical changes, and um, guarantee like the provision of ecosystem services. But on the other side, it's really important for us as well to uh, 
like the social aspect to educate people, to help communities to come together, um, to reconnect with nature. And also we want to do science. So for us, it's really important to not only uh, try to sell a nice product, uh, make a living from that, which is called tiny forest. And we just make assumptions on how good they are, but we want to uh, research them and uh, also engage people in the research. So currently with the organization Earthward Europe together, we are developing a citizen science program. Uh, they developed it and we are translating it into German and adapted to the German situation. In English, it's already available so that everyone can go out and take part. Like everyone of all the people who are engaged in this Miyawaki method and this tiny forest movement um, that they collectively in their projects collect data and so help to improve this method and uh, also help to uh, to create more arguments for people who are still skeptical uh, that we can and should implement more of these very easily uh, very easy to implement solutions like these nature-based solutions so these three aspects are equally important for us. Here you see some of the projects uh, we realized so far, just to get an overview how it can look like. Um, yeah, here in the middle, this is really in a very urban region uh, in the middle of a city. On the left, this is at a, the area of an hospital. At the right, this is a very big area, in a rural area, this is in Poland close to the German border, which was, I think, more than 2,000 square meters big. This is our biggest area so far. So you see um, many different characters, but still nature is uh, vital and sprouting everywhere. And all the areas before, they were bare land. There was maybe in some... Sometimes there was grass, sometimes there was nothing. And all the pictures you see... Uh, took only like between one and two and a half years to reach a stage which looks like that. Yeah, here's some before and after and another before and after. So yeah, only is it written here. Yeah, only one and a half years. So uh, really beautiful. Um, also like for me personally, I can say that it's uh, so, so satisfying to come back to an area you planted yourself, you plant and uh, organized and planted yourself. And then you see how nature slowly becomes more wild, more stable. Um, yeah, growing healthy. It's a really beautiful feeling. And so I can encourage everyone to plant his or her own tiny forest uh, or other ecosystem and see how it develops and feel how beautiful it feels. What's really important in our project is the civil participation. So here's some pictures which illustrate that. Um, there are many different possibilities and different groups. So in general, we work mostly with school classes, like for example, here in the middle, you see a group of school children and me in the background telling them something about forest ecosystems. Uh, here above, this uh, was a group of kindergarten children with their parents. Here down left, it's a group of just local people from the village in Poland, which planted the tiny forest. Uh, also here in Poland, where a very important politician of the region came to visit the project. So uh, if you implement a project like this, be sure that uh, the media or local politicians are going to be interested in it. This is our ex has been our experience, at least in Germany and Poland. Um, so yeah, many different cases, many different groups, and uh, always important to engage people because otherwise the acceptance for these projects or the understanding um, in society might not be there or might not be that high. 
And um, yeah, I think the impact, besides the ecological impact, the way greater impact we can have with these projects is doing them together. So I'm also really glad, or was really glad to hear that through this Erasmus program, uh, people from Germany, young people from Germany and from Gozo are collaborating on implementing a project in Gozo, which is really, really beautiful, actually. And um, I'm happy to see that more and more of these international collaborations uh, are happening and that more and more young people uh, yeah, become engaged in these projects and are interested to spend Friday evening uh, hanging out at the computer and listening to this kind of content. And the last point, uh, on the social aspect is uh, this green classroom character. So what we do when we implement our uh, tiny forests is we really actively use them as green classrooms and you can do and learn so much even in the young tiny forest, for example, doing microscopy and learn about soil biology and yeah, well, like how a soil looks like under the microscope or different insects. You can, like we go regularly to the tiny forest sites and each year measure the trees and then we can see which species are developing well, how the trees, how the trees grow in general and height and in biomass. We can also have a lot of fun and just play around, be creative. So a lot of potential to uh, do education and um, for us especially it's really important to uh, have the connection to the young children in the urban areas because they are often they are willing to be outside to play outside to plant but often the uh, there are just options missing and so we try to create spaces of experience where uh, yeah young people can engage with nature learn with nature grow with nature and after the planting, uh, just very briefly, briefly illustrated, uh, care measures in the first two to three years have to take place, which consists one of uh, the removal of, uh, of strongly growing grasses and herbs, which are in competition, like in strong competition to the, to the trees we planted. In general, it's good when on our side also other wildlife species come into the system, but when there are very strong um, and aggressively growing grasses which uh, take nutrition and sun from our planted seedlings, then we should remove them. And we need a moderate irrigation. So we have, as I already mentioned, we have to water our tiny forests in the first two to three years, but we don't want to water them too much because they don't, they shouldn't get used to a situation uh, which is not realistically in the future. So we try to water as much as needed for the plants to survive, but as less as possible so that they don't get used to unrealistic conditions. So there are only these two aspects, three years of caretaking, and then you should have kickstarted your system, which then is stable and functional on its own. And the education, so uh, this is just an example. We developed an education system, the Guardians of the Tiny Forest, which is an educational concept for third to sixth grades. Um, so for the Germans here, uh, maybe it would be a task for the future to translate it also in English language so that uh, a broader range of people can use it. But for now, it's uh, only available in German. Um, and then, yeah, there we are developing educational materials for teachers, different age groups, um, and so on and so forth. So, if for some reason in your project you want to also engage uh, younger people, uh, or potentially in future projects engage younger people, you can. Yeah, you're very welcome to contact us and uh, get free access to all the education materials, and then can translate it in every language you like. Um, yeah, so this is basically only another illustration of the topic I was talking about. Uh, yeah, 
What is also nice, uh, and we always want to mention that that uh, forests are not the only valuable ecosystems. And since there are also other initiatives, which, for example, uh, are active for the implementation of flower meadows or uh, ponds and ponds and water areas and so on, we are not in competition with people who have expertise and love for other ecosystems, but we see them as uh, yeah parts of the same puzzle. So we also um, started to integrate other ecological elements in our projects, like for example, um, insect hotels, deadwood elements, uh, stone walls for um, uh, for lizards and other animals. So just as an inspiration, you don't have to only plant a forest, but uh, other ecosystems are also valuable. And with very low tech and easy methods, you can create the diversity in the landscape. You can bring, uh, yeah, create different ecological niches where uh, different species are going to find a home. Um, yeah, uh, these examples we have seen already. Um, some other inspirations here from India, just to see how this whole method can be also upscaled. So this is between a road and, uh, and a big river where thousands of square meters have been planted using the Miyawaki method. And here is also in India an oxygen park um, planted by the Miyawaki method. This is what I was talking about earlier. So this is uh, an example from Thailand where an island planting has been taking place. So you can see uh, between these forest islands, which were planted uh, using the Miyawaki method, there's this very dry and hard soil. And this whole area, uh, a bit large area, has been regenerated or started to be regenerated by planting little islands using the Miyawaki method, which then slowly will become stable and then grow together. And so you put effort like acupuncture in uh, different little spots where you really, you know, instead of planting trees across the whole area and all then are going to die because it's too dry and um, the soil can't hold water and uh, yeah, they just die. You plant them more densely and concentrate your whole energy on the soil and a big quantity of plants in these little islands. So uh, the chances that uh, within a very short time span, um, the whole area is going to be a forest are very high. Um, and here, just, you know, I think it's three more pictures, and then we have some time for questions and discussion. Mm, just some examples from India, from very dry conditions, how a tiny forest can be uh, firstly designed as kind of a park with ways and uh, classroom and other elements, and also how on this very compact clay red soil with no humus at all uh, in a very short period of time it can look like this like a green oasis here another example also very harsh harsh conditions maybe i uh, know somehow comparable to gozo and also here we can see how in a very short period of time this is in Delhi in the department of biotechnology uh, in very short time this forest has grown and looks stable and resilient. And another example, which I also really like because it has the design of mandala. Um, also here, this is only some years after implementation and uh, the results can look like this. And so, yeah, these forests, I mean, they will grow, they will hopefully and probably stay functional oasis, even though conditions are going to change. The more of them, we implement now, the more, uh, yeah, they will take part and support the functionality of the whole global biosphere. And um, yeah, for me, it's the idea that I plant little forests in the cities now so that uh, yeah, the people who come after me can still enjoy these trees in 200, 300, 500 years. The, 
the shadow, the cooling, the birds who live in the trees. It's just a, a very beautiful image of the future. So yeah, I really like to see these examples and uh, it gives me a good feeling for the future. So I want to end with the last slide. This is a philosophical slide, which I always give even to politicians. Um, yeah, I just can't stop myself doing that. Here we see three illustrations on the left side described with ego. We see a pyramid. At the top is a human, the male human, dominating the rest of creation. And uh, yeah, this illustrates a mindset of male human domination over the rest of the world. So that there is a certain like a mindset that there's a certain hierarchy and that everything at the bottom of this pyramid is, has been only created or is only there to be exploited um, for the good of the top of the pyramid. Um, we can also call this mindset the, like the materialistic mindset, um, yeah, which is now slowly, slowly transforming into a new mindset. And this is illustrating in the middle, uh, which we could call eco. So it's a circle and all beings on this planet uh, have the same, the same value and are an equal part of this globe. So also share the same responsibilities and understand that uh, everything is kind of interconnected with each other um, and only functional when every part is uh, is existing and is healthy. Um, but the, there is even a new idea which uh, which I want to share with you. And this is titled with the with the word the term seva, which comes from Hindi from India. And uh, this means like roughly translated um, su supporting actively supporting life for the good of everyone. And yeah, you see the picture is the heart, maybe a little bit cheesy, but I mean, it illustrates, uh, it illustrates the idea actually very well. And human, male and female have the same position through their skills, their level of consciousness, their awareness that they can create or destroy things and that they can help or destroy nature. They are aware that they can regenerate, they can help, they can support the life and the health of the world, of each being, of the ecosystem. So they are very much aware of the responsibility they have through the gifts or the skills they have gotten. So, and they are not only aware, but they are taking this responsibility to actively shape and support life. And this is a very beautiful idea. And this is, I think, a mindset where we should all are heading to. And the tiny forest is only one tiny little thing uh, which fits very much in this mindset and uh, with which we can uh, yeah, actively do something uh, together with many other people and many other great ideas to um, tackle our socio-ecological challenges we have and creating a bright and beautiful future for life on Earth. And with this little philosophical excourse, I'm going to, uh, to end this presentation. And now I think we have like 15 minutes, 20 minutes left for discussion. Thank you very much. So yes, Stefan, thank you very much. It was a great and passionate uh, lecture, I guess. Uh, you are really, your heart is uh, in this, you can see. Um, I have a question mm -hmm. which comes to my mind. Uh, since I saw these uh, pictures from um, tiny forest just planted or a couple of weeks or so later, and uh, they were all very small plants. My question is now, does the trees have to have a certain age or, or size to be planted or can it also be bigger trees like, I don't know, 
one and a half or two meters already in growth. Yeah, uh, the trees can be bigger, uh, but it, it, it's two aspects. Like the first um, is that in general, young seedlings adapt better to uh, locations and they're still young and still in this adapting process than uh, older trees. Um, and it's like the logistics is easier because you can easily order many, many of these uh, very young little seedlings and also the price. Like uh, it's way, way cheaper. Like, for example, in Germany, it's one to five euros, depending on the species for one of these seedlings, which are usually between 30 and 80 centimeters. And uh, when you buy a bigger tree, which can be nice, and we did it sometimes for uh, the height and age structure right from the beginning, when there is a budget, it's also nice to plant some bigger trees already. But uh, in general, we have also seen that these the small trees we plant, they pretty soon overgrow the big trees we planted in the beginning because they are just way more, uh, there's way more energy in them and they easy, more easily adapt. But um, yeah, it's it's very much okay to also plant bigger trees in the system. Interesting, interesting. The small ones are the energetic ones. Yes, <laughs> great. Um, does any, anyone else has questions? Just feel free. Yes, I, have a, I have a question too. Uh, I'm Thorsten. Nice to meet you, Stefan. Thanks for for this uh, speech. You, you're you're burning for it. We feel it. Um, on your uh, slide with the vision on the right side, there was uh, a tiny forest with uh, a monitoring station or a measuring station. Is this usual or is this just uh, for some um, little forests that you say, okay, here we want to have a monitoring? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to have monitoring stations in every forest we planned, but uh... First, we have the problem that if it's a public space, especially in the cities, we always have uh, the chance of vandalism so that someone destroys or steals their devices. And on the other side, it's also a, a question of the financing because uh, when we plan for some customer, they are often not willing to pay for a sensory like like. Uh, is uh, scientific monitoring stations, but we do it for for all the tiny forests we can to slowly start to collect data. There's there's a bunch of data we can collect through citizen science programs, so people can do it directly. But there's also some data like uh, really good data for temperature over the year or for soil moisture, for example. Uh, which is easier to detect with monitoring stations. So we try to do it. We currently have in three of our 21 uh, projects, we have installed these stations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question that I have is about the shape. You showed us uh, different shapes of tiny forests, um, very interesting ones with uh, way through it and so, and uh, one was the, uh, the uh, green classroom. Do you have already an idea of the shape for Gozo? Is, or is it just uh, <laughs> uh, growing in your head? What will it be? Uh, I, I'd really, you know, the, the design should always fit the landscape and the specific location. So as soon as I know the location and have some good pictures and, um, and the coordinates, so I can look it up. I will have my personal idea, <laughs> that's for sure. But um, like, there is not not the, not the one design. Yeah. So I would I would say that it's very important that the local group decides together, like the stakeholders which are involved, uh, which design is is suitable for them, and it should be uh, created together with the land actually. So before we know the location, we can't uh, make a decision on the design. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Or maybe also apart from the from the lecture? Well, I guess a lot of input. Um, what is what is the second part about just uh, shortly in the next week? Mm 
Yeah. Um, next week, we're going to be more specific. So uh, I did my research on Gozo in general, like the soil conditions, the uh, native species and climate conditions and so on. And we're going to be more specific how to implement the tiny forest in Gozo, like my general ideas. I think, uh, how was he called? I don't know the full name, but Louis, like the, the expert uh, for um, ecology in Gozo, he will probably go more in detail on that. But like in the next two lectures from me, we are going to become more and more specific. Uh, on like an instruction how to actually implement the tiny forest. I will also show some footage, uh, some videos, how uh, the excavating of the soil can really look like and so on. Um, and next time, this time I have no homework and I also <laughs> didn't do a control of Casper's homework. <laughs> um, but next time I will have some specific questions like research questions for the group. Um, especially for the for the people in Gozo, but also some uh, research questions for the Germans. So yeah, we try like the the aim would be in the end that we after this lecture theoretically would be really able to uh, implement the tiny forest. And also in the end, I will provide the download link with some. Uh, important information they are in German but uh, like helping information for the actual project management which just we are using for our projects and in our workflow so they can be translated then and uh, and used from the group and uh, the slides from today are we getting them also uh, yeah yeah I will great. just uh, send them to you in PDF and then great can... great all right. Uh, what, I, what, is, what, what was uh, particularly interesting to me was, of course, the part where we have to do things together, um, the social and psychological impacts of uh, building together uh, such a such a forest, doing such a project. I hope this will this will work in our project too. That people come together. That people not only the students we have now together, but also when when the the forest. Get, uh, is getting realized that people are getting interested and um, yeah, taking care of it. Because this would be one of uh, our main tasks, I guess, getting people interested and in, uh, keeping this forest up, um, taking care, especially in Gozo, you, you know, all know it's uh, the irrigation. You, we have to water the, the, um, the forest because it's a dry land. So um, this would be part of the task too, uh, not only the planting, which seems quite easy, I guess <laughs> it's done. You say it can be done in a day, um, the planting. Um, so that's not that's almost the easy part of it. The, the difficult part would be the preparation of it, uh, the, the financing, uh, the marketing, getting supporters, getting sponsors uh, for the plants, uh, buying the plants, um, finding the location in the old project, uh, they, it's, it's done by the, by the government and uh, uh, Professor Kassar. But um, afterwards, we have to get people interested in taking care of it or keeping um, the German students uh, up to date, what's happening to the forest. They planted and stuff like that. So lots, lot, lot of things to do, but very exciting things, I guess. And I hope you all think the same. I hope so. And if there are no questions anymore, you can ask in the next time, in the the days, the, the times, they will come also. But then I would say we we'll wrap it up, right? Okay. So again, have nice dreams about forests and we see each other <laughs> next week on Friday. Have yeah. a good night. Bye bye. See you next week. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.